Okay. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining with us again today. Hope everybody's been having a blessed week and a safe week. And I pray that we have been holding up each other in prayer. And especially those who are sick and shut in and those who are on our uh, sick list. So let us keep everyone in prayer and continue to pray for our country as well as pray for our president and uh, our vice president. And we also want to uh, keep our church family up in prayer as well as our pastor in prayer today, okay? All right, let us go ahead and have some prayer, and then we're going to go ahead and get after our lesson. <clears throat> Would you bow your hands? Father, we thank you for the privilege once again to come into your presence. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, and we thank you for all your abundant blessings that you have bestowed upon us, dear Lord. We thank you for watching over us throughout this past week, Father, keeping us safe, and thanking you for bringing us back here once again to study your word. So we ask you right now to lead us and guide us in the way that you would have us to go and let us keep an open mind and an open heart to what you have to say to us today. And then let us use it and use it all for your glory. We pray this in your name, dear Lord, and for your sake. Amen. All right, let us get after it. Now, uh, we're going to pick back up on a lesson from last week, uh, dealing with the uh, characteristics. Uh, the subject of our lesson, of course, is decision-making, uh, discerning the will of God. But last week, uh, we was talking about, I showed you some characteristics of decision-making. And last week I gave you three of those characteristics and I hope you was following along with me. One of them was, was the dramatic method. The dramatic method. And the second one we looked at last week was the defaulting method. The defaulting method. And the third one we looked at was the delaying method. The delaying method. Amen? So, if you will, and if you want to follow along with us now, this, we're going to go into this fourth one here. Excuse me. This fourth one we want to look at here today. We're talking about the deductive method. That's the fourth one. Fourth one of these here characteristics of decision making, the deductive method. So let us talk about <clears throat> some deductive methods here for a moment, okay? Now, the Christian life is to be a life of balance. I said the Christian life is to be a life of balance between human deduction and spiritual insight. Okay? Now, what are we talking about here? Well, if we become solely analytical in thinking through a situation and choose to rely completely on logic, then we will miss God's way. Okay? I said we will miss God's way if we become solely analytical in thinking through a situation and choosing to rely completely on logic, we will miss God's way. Yet God says in Isaiah chapter 55 and 8, he says, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways. Amen. So, so you see, we make God after our own image and conclude that he thinks and acts just as we do. And he doesn't. Psalm 50 and 21, it says, these things you have done and I kept silent. You thought that I was altogether like you, 
but I will rebuke you. Amen. I will rebuke you and set them in order before your eyes. All right. So God ways is not our ways. God don't think like we think. Amen. He don't see things as we see them. Okay. Because he's God. All right. You see. And he said that he, he, he will he will set them in order before your eyes. You see, in other words, we are wrong. Have, have you ever tried to explain to if you ever tried to explain the grace of God to an unsaved person? Amen. Who thinks that heaven is a hall of fame? for achievers instead of father instead of the father's house for believers. Hmm? You ever tried that? Well, you see in this world uh, you work for what you get. And and you are suspicious of anything that is free. Amen. Anything that is free, we always have a suspicious eye out, out for it. So, so how does God go after calling and saving lost sinners? How does he do that? Well, by the power of his word. Amen? By the power of his word. You see, uh, I want you to go with me, if you will, go to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55, and we want to look at uh, verses 10 through 15. Isaiah 55 and 10 and 11. Five, ten, and eleven, and this is what he says. He says, "For as the rain comes down, and the snow from the he from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word." be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Amen? It shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. Now, God's word is seed, okay? as Luke 11 and 8 tells us, all right? Just as the rain and the snow are never wasted, but accomplishes his purpose, so, so his word never fails. You see, the word of God, as Isaiah 40 and 8 says, shall stand forever. The word of God shall stand forever. Heaven and earth will pass away before one jot or one tittle of his word pass away. Amen. We never know how God will use even a casual word of witness to plant and water the seed in someone's heart. Okay. We just, we don't never know. Okay. Are you with me? You, are, did you get that point? Okay. Now, let, let us look at this. Uh, fifth point here of uh, this fifth point, this fifth characteristic. Are you with me? Okay. Talking about uh, desirous methods. Desirous methods. What are you talking about here? Well, let's talk about it for a minute. You see, too many people allow their emotions to have Soul control. Amen. Too many people allow their emotions to have soul control. 
Now, what does this mean? Well, this means allowing your feelings to determine your behavior. See, your feelings will mess you up, okay? God gave us emotions, but he never intended emotions to be our decision maker. And many of us doesn't even realize that we often have an if it feels good, it must be good mentality. Amen. You ever heard people use that analogy? Well, you know, if it, if it feels good, it must be good. No, it isn't. Your feelings will mess you up. Yet God says in Proverbs 28 and 26, he who trusts in himself is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom is kept safe. Amen. So, so, so let us talk about the discerning method. The discerning method. Amen. The discerning method is the best method. Okay, that's number six. The discerning method. Okay, so, so what does it mean to be discerning? What, what does that mean? Well, to be discerning is to grasp what may not be evident. That is, to have insight and understanding by going beyond what seems obvious, okay? Spiritual discernment, therefore, is wisdom to determine what is true, appropriate, and superior in the eyes of God, regardless to how things may seem, all right? Regardless to how they may seem. Yet God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and 14, he says, the man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Okay? So you see, the spirit matures the believer. The spirit does. Okay? As that verse 14 through 16 tells there in that same 1 Corinthians. Okay? 1 Corinthians there, chapter uh, 2. Okay? Now... <clears throat> So, so, so the contrast here is between the saved person called spiritual because he is indwelt by the spirit and the unsaved person called natural because he does not have the spirit within. Please listen carefully. Okay, that's why we cannot talk to uh, unsaved people about spiritual things. We can't just go at them head on with a lot of Bible stuff, a lot of scriptures and so forth. Amen. Because they are not spiritually discerned. Okay? What, you, what we're saying to them is foolishness to them in many ways. Okay? Are you listening to what I'm saying? So they don't have the spirit within as 1 Corinthians 3, 1 and 4 said, Paul, amen, Paul will introduce a third kind of person talking about the colonel man. He is the immature Christian, the colonel man. He is the immature Christian, the one who lives on a childhood level, if you will. Because he will not feed on the word and grow. That's why you see a lot of people still in church. Amen. Still feeding on, still at a childhood level. Because he, they will not feed on the word and grow. Amen. They, they, some people don't pick up their Bible until they come to church. Many of them don't even bring a Bible to church sometimes. Are you listening to me? So that's why, see, you can't grow without the word. You cannot grow without the word. Amen? 
You see? Now, the Bible says that faith, it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, at one time, every Christian, please listen carefully, we all was natural, having only the things of nature. We all was at once. But when we trusted in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Spirit came in and we moved into a plane of spiritual able to live in the realm of the spirit. Does that make sense to you? Then we had to grow. Everything has to grow. You see? We, as Christians, we're constantly growing. And how do we grow? We keep growing through the word. Amen? Keep growing, keep growing. Everything has to grow. You can't put a seed in the ground tonight and expect to go out tomorrow and harvest you know, whatever it was that you planted. It has to take time. It has to grow. That's why we have to be patient with people who are unsaved. Amen. We, we can be our best testimony will be us. Amen. That would be a better testimony than throwing the Bible at them. That They have to see things through us. Amen. How we walk, how we talk, how we act, how we love, how we give, and how we talk how we act, you see, that will bring them closer to Christ than anything that we might try to share with them out of the Bible right now because they're not ready for that just yet. You have to feed it to them gradually. Amen? So we don't want to run people away. Are you listening to me? You see? So the unsaved man cannot receive the things of the Spirit because he does not believe in them and cannot understand them. Please understand. But as the Christian, as they grow day by day, receive the things of the Spirit, then he grows and then he matures. Okay? Now, one of the marks of maturity is discernment. Please listen carefully. One of the marks of maturity is discernment. Okay? And as I said before, it's the ability to penetrate beneath the surface of life and see things as they really are. Amen? Because, see, unsaved people walk by sight and really see nothing. But we as Christians, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. The Bible said without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? So, so they are spiritually blind. Okay? And the maturing Christian, he grows in his spiritual discernment and develops the ability with spiritual help. Okay? Now, so, so to understand more and more of the will and the mind of God. The Corinthians, you see, they lacked their discern. They lacked this discernment. Okay? They were spiritually ignorant. Spiritually ignorant. Okay? You see, to have the mind of Christ does not mean that we are infallible and start playing God in the lives of other people. So I want you to make that very clear, okay? Nobody instructs God. Nobody instructs him. Paul quoted Isaiah 40 and 13, amen, in that passage. Nobody, amen, instructs God. Also, if you look at that uh, Romans chapter 11, 33 through 36 as well, so, so to have the mind of Christ, it means to look at life from the Savior's point of view. All right? Having his values and desires in mind. So it means to think God thoughts and not think as the world thinks. See, as Christians, we need to learn and should learn how to think 
theologically. If that makes sense. Okay? Because you see, the unsaved person does not understand the Christian. Unsaved people don't understand us. They don't understand us. You see? So, 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 so we have to we have to tread lightly when we are dealing with unsaved people. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Because, see, they live in two different worlds. They don't live in the same world we live in. But the Christian understands the unsaved person. They don't understand us, but we understand them. Amen? Why? Because we were once like that too. Okay? So let us look at a biblical example, if you will, turn to uh, Genesis chapter 6, if you will, in your Bibles. I'm going to read, read this from my uh, New King James. All right? New King James. Genesis chapter 6. And we want to look at verses 5. We're going to do quite a bit of reading here. Genesis 6, 5. And we're going to read it from uh, 5, beginning at verse 5. And we're going to read it right down through verse 22. And this should take us just about to the rest of our time. And we'll, we'll, then we'll try to explain some of this for us, okay? Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5 through 22. And this is what it says. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them, but nor found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Nor. Nor was a just man perfect in his generation, nor walked with God, and nor begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make room in the ark and cover it inside out and with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubic from above and set the door of the ark in, in, its, in its side. You shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. And behold, I myself am bringing uh, flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is breathed of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wives, and your son wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the bird after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. 
and you shall take for yourselves of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus nor did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Amen. He did all God had commanded him, so he did. In other words, you see, Noah was a righteous man. He was a righteous man who walked with God. Amen. You see, then because of his personal relationship with the Lord, he knew God's voice. And having the heart of a servant, we was willing to do everything just as God had commanded him. Everything. Even though his uh, construction of an ark, amen, which was a mammoth, mammoth structure on dry land, made Noah look foolish <laughs> in the eyes of his friends. Can you imagine them? How they was looking at Noah? You going to build this mammoth ark? For what? Amen. You see, without knowing the future, Noah focused on what God was doing. And he adjusted his life according to God's plan rather than asking God to bless his own plan. Amen. If God has showed you something to do, don't you be trying to circumvent what God said. You just do. Okay, how big it is, how complicated it may be. If God shows you, told you to do it, then you need to get after it. Amen. Because God is not going to give you anything that you can accomplish on your own. Please listen to me carefully. See, so logically, nor could have chosen to build a place of worship. Logically, he could have if it had been his choice. After all, weren't the people morally corrupt and spiritually bankrupt? Amen. Yes, they were, you see. But God knew the people would remain unrepented. Something nor did not know. That's why God said, your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. See, God knew they would be unrepentant. So, so if Noah had built a church, guess what? He and his family alone, he and his family alone with the church would have washed away instead of doing what God said. See, you got you to you you stay on God's plan. Amen. Him and the church and everybody else would have been washed away if he had built a worship center instead of building that big boat that God told him to build. You see? So here in that Genesis 6.22, Noah did, the Bible says here, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. He didn't deviate to the right. He didn't deviate to the left. He didn't try to shave off an inch of this cubit or an inch of that cubit or an or, or inch of this width or tried to put another door where he told him not to put a door. He did everything identically the way God told him to. Amen? You see, I heard someone once actually say, well, how did Noah gather all these animals? Amen? Be, be careful. People ask you that. How did, they, how did he gather all these animals? Well, in his sovereign power, God brought the animals to Noah and his sons to and, and controlled them so that they did not, amen, so, so they did as his bidding. He brought them to Noah, everything. Well, none of those animals was going to hurt Noah because God brought them to him. God had, God had subdued them. They was, they was tamed. Amen. Can you imagine being in a big old boat with all them uh, vicious animals, lions and snakes and all that stuff? No, God had subdued all of them. Are you listening? So this magnificent demonstration of God's power didn't touch the heart 
of his neighbors. Why? You see, and they perished in the flood. You see, the birds, the beasts, and the creeping things knew their creator's voice and they obeyed him. Amen. They obey. Everything will obey God but man. All them animals, everything knew. They knew God's voice. No one didn't have nothing to be frightened about. But people made in the image of God refused to heed God's call. Okay? Centuries later, God will say through his servant Isaiah, the ox knows his master, the donkey his owner. Amen? His owner, manager. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 3 in the NIV. Amen? During all of this important activity, nor was serving the Lord, amen, and bearing witness to a sinful world for 120 years. Right there in Genesis chapter 3. Amen. God was long suffering towards careless and rebellious sinners. But they ignored his message and lost their opportunity for salvation. Amen. And that's what's happening to people today. People ignoring God's message and they're going to lose their salvation. And that's not what God desires for us. Now I'm out of time, but we're going to pick back up on this next week. Amen. And we're going to talk about what are the tests for decision making. Okay, we're going to talk about the test. Amen. For decision making. We're going to pick back up there next week. If you follow along with me, please come back with me next week and let us talk about that. Okay. All right. So that's so. So we see here these rebellious sinners. They ignored God's message and they lost their opportunity for salvation. And that's what we don't want you to do. If you are an unsaved person, you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your heart and be your Lord and Savior. Amen. You can do that right now. Don't miss your opportunity for salvation. Because believe me, as sure as we are here today, talking face to face, you're going to die. You're going to die and you have to have some place to go. Amen. Not that you have to have some place to go. You do have some place to go. You only got two places. And that's either heaven or hell. And if I was you, I wouldn't miss my opportunity. You can just say, you can say, Lord, I am a sinner. I'm a sinner and I'm in need of a Savior. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you were buried and you rose again on the third day. Would you come into my heart? Would you come into my life, in my heart, and be my Lord and Savior? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you will be saved. Amen? You will be saved. You see? So, so don't miss your opportunity. Tomorrow is not promised to you. Matter of fact, the next minute is not promised to you. Don't waste your opportunity for salvation. You pray a prayer like that, and you mean that from your heart. God will hear that prayer, and he will come in, and he'll save you. He'll seal you with his Holy Spirit. And if you would die tonight, you would go straight to heaven. Amen. So if that's you and you're listening to us today on this broadcast and you know that you're not saved, or if you think that you're saved and you don't, re you don't really know and you really want to be absolutely sure that you 
say. Amen. Pray that prayer and watch God move in upon your spirit. And he'll save you. Can't think of nobody who wouldn't want that. That's my message to us today. It's my lesson for us. Come back with me next week and let us finish unraveling some more of this lesson, okay? So may God bless you and may he keep you. May his face shine upon you. And in your prayers uh, throughout the week, please continue to remember Deacon Sam Black in your prayers, uh, him and his uh, whole family, okay? Hold them up. Uh, Deacon Black is a one of our great deacons in the church. Amen. And he's been out for quite a while now. And we want to keep him up in a lot of prayer. Keep him up in a lot of prayer. God still answers prayers. Amen. Because we're never out of hope in Jesus Christ. So continue to pray for him, for your church family. Continue to pray for our country. Continue to pray for your pastor. And continue to pray for each other. Amen. Okay, let us bow our heads. Father, in the presence of Jesus, we come into your presence to say thank you. We thank you, dear Lord, for what you have shared with us in your lesson today. We thank you for uh, your grace, and we thank you for your mercy. And we thank you, dear Lord, for giving us a, a spirit of discernment, dear Lord. Keep us, uh, may we always keep our mind and our heart steadfast on you. And, and stay in your word, dear Lord, and let your word teach us and and grow us, oh, Father God, in every way we stand in need. We ask you to bless those whom we've asked for prayer, Father. We ask you to continue to bless our president, our country, and just bless us as only you can bless us, Father. You said in your word, dear Lord, if anything you ask in my name, according to my will, you said you would do it. And we know it's your will, dear Lord, that we be in good health and that we prosper. So we thank you for that wonderful promise today. Bless now, Father, as only you can bless us. Bring us back next week at the next appointed hour so we can finish studying your word. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a blessed week and a safe week. And come back with me next week, okay? God bless you.